Welcome to How We Scaled It for Design Teams, a show that explores the journey through the arduous road to growing a successful design practice. I'm your host, Adam Perlis, CEO and founder of Academy, a UX staffing and recruiting agency. And today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Richard Banfield, the former VP of Design Transformation at Envision, distinguished author and artist. In this episode, we'll explore the strategies and tools that Richard offers to design leaders, drawing from his vast experience in leading, coaching, and advising, from navigating conflicts and managing stress to fostering a thriving team environment, Richard empowers leaders to create impactful designs and achieve remarkable success. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Adam. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks for coming, Richard. So um, today we're going to dive into a few topics and mostly surrounding assembling healthy design teams. Really? And uh, just to give uh, the audience a little bit of context, could yeah. you share a little bit about your background, also what you're up to now? Yeah, so um, the the team dynamic or understanding the assembly and maintenance and curation and nurturing of healthy teams started when I left high school. I was conscripted into the army back in South Africa. And uh, my path took me to the offices um, there's a, a school, an academy for, for officers. And uh, I started to learn a little bit about leadership. I started to see what some of the leadership models were. And at that point, the military was evolving from being a very top-down organization to understanding that really what decisions are the, kind of the lifeblood of teams and they need to happen on the ground. So the entire military was rethinking how it, it structured itself. And it was a really interesting opportunity for me to see that. Um, I then uh, did some school, uh, university stuff, um, didn't really stick. I, I managed to find myself on a remote island in the middle of the Indian Ocean called the uh, Islamic Republic of the Comores, a very, very remote place uh, as a scuba diving instructor. And that also gave me opportunities to learn how to work with others who are very different from you, different language, different culture, different religions, all these kinds of things. So I had about 40 guys working for me and, um, it was amazing. It was just a most wonderful, wonderful experience, but also a real baptism of fire, you know, just not understanding anything was very young, very wet behind the ears, literally and figuratively. Um, and then that kind of evolved and, and, um, based on the fact that I also have an entrepreneur as a father, I, I started companies. I'd been printing t-shirts as a teenager and selling beds. I'd actually like made futons and beds at some point, which I was selling. Um, and then this thing called the internet came along at some point, And I found myself in a company that was interested in selling that, uh, as part of their media offering. And that evolved into me actually starting a company. So I've had all these very strange media, internet tech, um, hospitality, military leadership experiences, which I don't know if that's entirely unique, but I think it's kind of in, um, interesting that I've seen leadership from a lot of different perspectives. So um, now, you know, fast forward 20 years, having been the CEO of, of a, um, an agency, a product design agency, worked in organizations like Envision, um, written the books and, and, and toured around the world, exposing people to uh, what I had learned through those interviews that I'd done for the books. Um, all of these are really interesting ways to define what leadership is, define what team structure looks like, what health looks like. And my viewpoints have changed. My experiences have helped me see health of teams and the assembly of teams through lots of different you know, perspectives and lenses. So I think um, I'm kind of like a um, a B grade Malcolm Gladwell for this industry, where I go around ask a lot of questions and then vomit that into a book or an article or in, in some cases, you know, while we're at Envision, we made a couple of movies, we made documentaries, uh, we made a learning platform, uh, and obviously I've had the opportunity to to speak about this on on various stages around the world. So I think of myself more as a journalist. Um, I am also an artist. Uh, I paint and create uh, probably about 50% of the time now. And I find that that duality helps me experience 
uh, creativity and the working with others through a completely new lens. So that's a whole different perspective as well. I think it also brings um, a sense of self and a sense of compassion and empathy to the entire creative process so that I'm not just looking at it through uh, this I, this perspective or the, the, um, the lens of what is it to be a leader, but also what is it to be a creator, uh, a practitioner, and how do those two things mesh with each other on a day-to-day basis? So um, kind of a long answer, but yeah, I've, I've had a very curious and creative life with lots of different things going on. And um, yeah, it's given me different perspectives, which I hope will you know be helpful to other people as well. Absolutely. And and with those perspective, I mean, you share so much of that in a lot of the work that you really do today, which is you help advise a lot of companies, you work with executives, design leaders in particular, a lot of times, but sometimes not. Um, what are some of the common issues that arise when working with these folks? And I'm sure they, they share a lot with your previous experience um, where you've helped advise them. Yeah. Well, my, my advisory practice is a little different from, say, traditional executive coaching or um, advisory work that you might do at the board level, which I have done and I continue to do. But the advisory practice that I run is primarily focused on the individual that I'm working with and the health that they're creating for themselves intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and then how that shows up at work and what influence that has on the others that they work with. So um, my perspective or my thesis is that if I can create a healthy individual, then that healthy individual will become the advocates and proxy for additional health within their team. And very often I'm working with the CEO or the CPO or the CDO. Um, and so that person has a significant influence over the people around them, either through their, um, their presence, their voice, their position, their authority. So it's very important that we're solving for the individual first. Um, and then the metaphor there is something that I borrowed from my, my scuba diving days, and that is you can't be a good lifesaver if you're drowning. Right? So you can't be a great CEO, a great leader, a great design leader, a great product leader, a great sales leader if you yourself are, are drowning, if you're struggling, if you're uh, struggling physically, you're struggling emotionally, you don't have uh, good relationships with um, the, cl- the people that are closest to you, whether that's friends or family, you're not going to be able to bring your full self, your most authentic self to the workplace. So um, it, th- that practice is slightly different. I lead with a lot of love and compassion. I talk about these rounded edges. Gentle leadership is is a concept that I'm working on and potentially a book that I'll, I'll publish eventually. But it is, it's a much more gentler approach. There's no loud voices. There's no stick carrying um, it's very thoughtful, it's, it's listener-based. And I find that that ultimately creates the environment for teams to create their own health. So that's the advisory work I do. And I have about six or seven clients right now, ranging from nonprofits like the Pan Mass Challenge, which is the largest athletic fundraising event in the world, um, all the way through to, to startups and some very well-known um, companies that have done incredible work I won't mention them by name just because I think they're, the, the work that I do is best served as an arm's length, as an anonymous relationship that I have with them. Uh, but you can see the companies that I work for, for on my LinkedIn profile. You can see um, which of those companies I represent. That's amazing. And you know, you talked a little bit about you know health of, of the individuals that you work with. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, also with that means that there is sort of a team health that cascades down yep. to yeah. those other members of the team that those people lead. What do you think, you know, team health means in your eyes? What, what does that look like? Well, the most obvious or almost superficial stuff that I think is easy to understand are the things like, do I feel safe? Do mm-hmm. I feel the, that I have permission to bring my full self to work, to show up without judgment, without trying to be controlled. Um, any of those ego or fear-based things feel like an unhealthy version of that. So they, the antithesis of that. So let's talk a little bit about how this shows up. Um, poor health is often the 
manifestation of the environment that we create. You know, we are connected to ourselves, to everybody else and to the environment. And so when we have these environments that are unhealthy, uh, they tend to breed unhealthy individuals as well. So a lot of the dysfunction of our lives starts at work because the work environment is primarily a fear-based environment. Um, and I say fear-based is because it's it's seeking control over chaos. So we, we've we conflated the, the concepts of complexity and complicated. So where complicated is like a car engine, you can figure out how to eventually get around it. Like it's complicated, there's lots of moving parts, but you can figure out how to how a car engine works, watching a couple of YouTube videos, tinkering around there. When you take your car to the mechanic, uh, it, you don't expect that you know the car is just going to turn into um, a magical pumpkin, right? It's it's not magic. It's it's easy to to assume that somebody with an education can figure it out. Complexity is very different. Complexity is like the weather. It's like traffic. It's like human beings. It's like babies. They are completely unpredictable, and work is unpredictable. So. Um, it's complex. It involves lots of different people. It involves lots of moving parts. Every business has unique aspects to it, unique cultures, and that makes it complex. It's like the weather. It's very, very difficult to predict. But we have made this assumption that it's not complex, but complicated. We think that we've figured it out. We think that if we read a couple of books about strategy and go to a couple of courses, that we will have figured work out. And the reason why that assumption is dangerous is because Work is not a place that you can control, right? Just like weather isn't something you can control or, um, you know, the, the, the relationships that you have with other people. You shouldn't be seeking control over other people, but you should be seeking to understand. You should be seeking to have empathy and compassion for the people around you so that for the most part, you can at least understand each other. Even if you don't agree, even if you're not completely aligned on every single issue, but at least you understand that person's perspective, understand where they're, where they're coming from, how it's informed, what their childhood and other experiences have been like in order to inform that. And so, you know, the understanding that the place of work is not something you can control is a misunderstanding, you know, is, is misunderstood because most people are trying to control it. They're trying to create processes and policies and bureaucracy. And we've got to the point now where bureaucracy is indistinguishable from sabotage because we're trying to control so many things with so many rules and so many policies and so many processes. I mean, think about agile and, and things like this, which, you know, promise the world, but actually never deliver. These things are our attempt at control of a complex system, which is, you know, an oxymoron. It doesn't, it's not possible. So the reason why that's important from a team health point of view is because if we show up at work, if we show up as leaders, if we show up as team members, and we think that we can control the chaos, if we think that we can just manage ourselves back to health, we're always going to suffer. We're always going to be at conflict with the reality. Um, and then we become impatient, right? And that impatience leads to additional frustration and additional stress. And so we're always competing against something that we shouldn't be competing against. We should rather focus on the things that we do have control over, like how do we show up in the world? What is it that we understand about ourselves? How can we then communicate those things to other people so that they all understand each other better? So team health very often just looks like good health for human beings. And then that's the other distinction is that we tend to have this work-life balance argument where in fact work is life and life is work. And, and you know it's hard to separate those two things. So I think it's a and unfortunately, a long answer, there's no like short answer right now, but I am experiencing that those individuals that are interested in transforming themselves, are inter interested in their selfhood, their consciousness, their awareness, uh, almost at a spiritual level, like they're, they're really showing up in the world thinking, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I doing here? Those people bring a completely different energy to the workplace and a different kind of opportunity for health. And they seek to understand, they seek to understand themselves and others. And I think that's the first step. So I always start with understand as the key word. Understanding yourself, understanding the others, understanding context can take a little time. It's not going to happen overnight. It could take weeks, months, years for it to work. But when it does eventually gel, 
it creates something unstoppable. And we've seen that in, you know, some sports contexts and other contexts where a team just gels, right? When you might, may not have a team of MVPs, they may not be the best individually, but as a group, they work really well. So we know that that's possible. We know that it's, it's there. We've seen high performing teams. I've witnessed dozens of these teams working well together. But they do invest deeply in understanding themselves and the others, and they also invest deeply in the context of the work that they do. So that's the first step. Um, I'll take a breath, and you can ask other questions, and then we can talk about some of the other elements sure. as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that was a wonderful summary, and you know, all of those things from you know emotional kind of well-being of the individual and the leader to establishing, you know, trust and psychologically safe environments where people can be free to share ideas. Um, you know, I think, and, and also clear communication, all these things kind of like, um, resonate with me, uh, especially, you know, as a leader of a team myself and also, um, having done this for, for quite some time, one of the things that, you know, I've found and, and I've, it's also backed up by a lot of research. Um, there was actually a great study that was done many years ago by Google about the, the, the one thing that makes successful teams is, you know, building trust through a psychologically safe environment. And so I wanted to go back to that because you mentioned it actually as the first thing uh, in team health. And <clears throat> I wanted to kind of hear from you, you know, what do you think are the things that leaders do or can do? Um, and, and maybe some of the folks, you can use some examples of some of the either, either um, groups you've worked with um, where they can establish this type of environment because it's, it's not easy. It, it actually, it could come through as a framework, but it could also just come along naturally. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. So there's a, a phrase that's sometimes used in, um, I'd say like in the, the fitness world, I've also heard it used in something in, in some other contexts, but mood follows action. So if psychological safety, health, trust, attitude, if those are moods, right? If those are feelings, if those are a sense of self or a sense of belonging or a sense of understanding, um, a sense of reliability, they have to start somewhere. And so I think what we've made the mistake of doing, especially in, in the last couple of generations of, of parenting, is that we were seeking to find motivation before we do the thing. And it's the wrong way around. We're doing the thing, and that leads to the motivation. Doing the thing is the, the and, and again, this might sound a little bit spiritual, but the reason why you're human is because you're you're having a human experience, and being human is an action oriented or a um, a physical oriented space to be in a physical oriented experience or, or a dimension. That that gives us a clue as to how we need to translate from one experience into another experience. It's through action. So think about a design sprint, something that a lot of your listeners will be listening you know, very familiar with. How many times have you done a design sprint and you thought, wow, I can't believe in four or five days we did nine months of work or we, we unblocked ourselves. Well, why? Because a design sprint is primarily an action oriented experience. It's focused very much on doing and thinking by doing is very different to thinking to do, right? You can sit around and you can prognosticate until the cows come home, nothing will happen doesn't change anything. But if you think by doing, if you take action to change the mood, change the, the style of the work, you'll find that things happen a lot quicker and people get it a lot quicker. In other words, they understand and feel it so that they can then translate that into something that they're motivated by. So let's talk about what the specifics, like the tactical stuff, like the real meat of that is. How do you feel if I say to you, we're going to do this massive three-year-long roadmap of a project versus, hey, Adam, I've got this task that needs to be done just today. It's totally doable. We're going to celebrate at the end of the day that it was completed. Those are two completely different action-oriented 
initiatives, right? One is overwhelming. One is not. And so what we've done is we've created an environment in which everybody's trying to make a dent in the universe. Right? That's like, we're trying to be the biggest, the best. We own this market. We're going to you know, shake things up. We're going to be disruptive. We're going to be an innovative. And a lot of that's just that kind of um, ego-based tech bro vocabulary that doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't like have any traction in the world. And so what we've got is big goals, big batches of work, big teams, lots of money chasing things that are almost impossible to achieve. And so that sense that people have when they show up at work is initially they're like, whoa, that sounds cool. And then immediately it's followed by, oh my God, I can't do this. This is impossible. So for a leader, the most important thing you can do is orchestrate action around very achievable things. So make your teams smaller. Make your goals smaller. Make your work batches smaller. Focus on the things that you can do today and tomorrow versus the things that are going to happen in three years' time. When I hear some of the leaders that I'm coaching talk about sitting down to write a year-long roadmap or a two-year or three-year roadmap, it just, you know, it feels to me like a complete waste of time. Can you imagine those teams were writing those roadmaps in January of 2000? 21 was it when did we have the the first covid um was that 20 something 20, like that 20, 20, 20. <laughs> yeah I, so you just sat down back. you just finished your big strategy meeting you had you know, had an off-site you spent hundred thousand dollars flying everybody in from everywhere you wrote a three-year roadmap and then covid comes along and so instead of building teams around this idea that you can predict and control the future rather build the skills that will make them masters of today's fate, like the, the present fate, the anti-fragility. So this the reason why I wear the peony is because it's a symbol of anti-fragility, right? It gets destroyed by the winter every year and it comes back even brighter and more beautiful every year. And that's what we should be doing with our teams. We should be constructing frameworks where they can be successful even when they get smashed down, even when bad things happen, even when the market turns on them. One of my clients is in crypto, right? That it's 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 going to happen. Shit's going to hit the fan. It's inevitable. So instead of pretending that you have control and pretending that you can predict the future, rather focus on the skills that make you anti-fragile. There's a great book called Anti-Fragile. Highly recommend it. You can take those principles and you can and work them into your own frameworks or your own context. But this idea that we've got big goals and big batches and parallel work and the illusion of taking control over time, like, oh, a roadmap is just going to somehow magically happen. Um, you know, you've got silos of work, you've got different teams with different titles and different locations. All of these things are dissuading sharing, they're dissuading learning, they're dissuading action. And when you do that, you're hurting the organization, right? You're hurting the opportunity for success and you're ultimately creating a poor health environment. And on the other end of that stuff, is or the the antithesis of that is understanding spending time together either virtually or in real life however it's possible for you to do that getting to know each other who are you what motivates you what incentives do you have both at home and at work how do i understand those incentives why are you here what's your purpose what are you trying to achieve what's your love language how do you explain yourself how do you show yourself in the world how do you describe the work that you're doing um, we've all worked with people who can only live in a spreadsheet, right? That's how they live. They see the world through a spreadsheet. That's their love language. Great. Now that I know that, that makes it easier for me as a leader to see how you're communicating and then translate that for others as well. Reducing the batches of work, reducing the sizes of goals, delaying, um, you know, just like trying to get stuff done for the sake of it getting done and rather like moving through understanding towards getting to something that's actually useful and valuable and healthy for everybody. Um, integrating frequently, um, prioritizing learning, making sure that we're all learning every day, that we've got time to reflect, that we've got time to understand what it is that we're actually doing. Hey, we just released that thing. What happened? Did we talk to sales? Did we find out if that feature actually was able to do anything? We speak to marketing? No, we just, we're ne on to the next thing, right? We were always, <laughs> it's like endless cycle. And so, um, I've, I've, you know, I've shared a couple of these very tactical things, but 
The reason why that's not attractive to, to a lot of businesses is because it feels gentle. It feels caring. It feels soft. And they're interested in a much more masculine way of looking at the world, which is, you know, military oriented. It has like a lot of terms like strategy and hierarchy and structure and control, which ironically, the military doesn't care about anymore. Like all those things are like, yeah, we don't use that. That's, that happened a century ago and it didn't work. So we're not going to do it again. Um, but you know, business hasn't evolved. Business hasn't really changed. We still have this weird hierarchy of how people are supposed to work. And it's one of the only industry or the only places in the world where that hasn't evolved. In every other space you look at it and they're like, no, no, this doesn't work. You know, small batches of work, small teams, small focus. That's much more gentle on the person, less less burnout, less less likelihood to rebel against the system in the sense of like, this is not working and therefore I'm gonna leave. Forty eight million people resigned during the last um, you know, I think it was like the last two years. Forty eight million people resigned because work sucks. So anybody who's listening to this saying, oh, you know, it's not that bad. It's really bad. <laughs> it's, it's extremely bad. And and if you're not responding to this in a way that's more gentle and more caring and more um, uh, compassionate, then you're being tone deaf. You're not really listening to what's going on. You're not really observing what's happening in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the things you said you know, earlier was um, really rallying the team to unite um, around common goals. And that's a big part of what happens from psychological safety when that gets established, where people feel free to both share their ideas with the group, as well as celebrate working together and, you know, tackling uh, different tasks uh, to aligned towards a common goal. And then what you were starting to talk about, uh, which is collaboration, right? And figuring out ways to collaborate better with your counterparts. And those can be counterparts inside of your group. Those can be counterparts outside of your group. Um, it could be sales, it could be marketing, it could be product, it could be uh, engineering. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the stories that you've kind of heard or the, the challenges you've worked through with leaders um, in terms of those collaborations, because they often are fraught with tension in competing priorities. Um, could you share a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I think the first framework or perspective you've got to reflect on is that a leader that's assembling a team, the team is their product. So very often I'll meet a product team leader and they'll be like, oh yeah, I, I lead a product team. And I was like, well, what do you think you do on that team? And they'll tell me that they, you know, prioritize features and that they are responsible for the process and they're responsible for recruiting and hiring and that, you know, they judge themselves on the quality of the product. And I go, okay, but isn't the team your product? And it's a bit of a moment of like, oh, yeah, people are, the, the assembly and nurturing of those people is the product. What comes out of that product is ultimately the practitioner's work, right? So the leader, their responsibility is to make a product that makes a product. And the product is the team. And so if you find yourself as a practitioner, sometimes, you know, this is very, very common. You're a good designer, you're a good product person, you're a good engineer, you're a good marketer suddenly you're leading a team, well, do you have any experience managing teams? Do you have any experience managing people? Do you even want to manage people? Do you like people, <laughs> right? A lot of these people that I interview, they're like, I don't really want to be here, but this is the only way my, my career can uh, progress. That's the way that HR has designed the organization. We get back to that ridiculous hierarchy. The only way that somebody can progress is to become a manager of people, but they don't want to be managers of people. They don't want to do that work. And if you're not willing to be a practitioner of people and you'd rather be pushing pixels or writing code or whatever it is that you do, then that's the wrong job for you. And then you need to be honest with yourself and move back into a senior IC position. But the job is to assemble the product, which is called a team, not the product itself. That is the job of the people that work on your team. If you assemble the right team and you do a really good job, 
of giving them the psychological safety and the collaborative tools and opportunities. They will do their job. But your job is to create that space. So that's the, the framework you've got to think about. So where I see this um, in, in anecdotal or practical ways not working is the people that are managing these teams very often don't have the emotional fortitude to have hard conversations, to assemble and maintain and nurture those teams because it is a series of hard conversations. It's a series of conversations about getting to know people, finding resolutions to conflict, building the opportunity for people to find each other and, and build alignment, understand what it is that they're doing. All of those are difficult conversations. And so the, the reason why people don't like to have difficult conversations is because they will feel guilty that somebody doesn't like them. They're scared that somebody will maybe push back at them. They have some kind of childhood shame associated with conflict, right? That they, and I'm not belittling it. That's like a major issue for all of us, especially if you grew up Catholic or Jewish. It's like part of the family. Like, you know, just guilt is part of it. Like, you just, you know, that's how you feel. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's this thing, I, you know, I, I made a painting called Shame Will Kill You, where shame, unfortunately, undermines a lot of what we do. We are so shameful that we're going to be misunderstood or shameful that we're going to be disliked or shameful that we're going to hurt somebody's feelings, that we don't say what needs to be said. And I'm not saying have mean conversations. I'm just saying have honest, open, meaningful conversations, which expose us all and, and allow us to all be vulnerable in ways that ultimately move us forward. And so that's a skill, and that skill has to be learned. Not all of us grew up like that. A lot of us grew up with the opposite of that, with like really bad vocabulary and skills for resolving conflict and understanding ourselves and being able to communicate that. So, so often the leaders find themselves in a position where they have to do that work on themselves first. They have to first figure out how to speak their truth in a way that has kindness and empathy and compassion associated with it, but is also truthful, right? I can say to you, like, here's a really, really, really good example, which I've encountered a few times. You go out for, let's say you go out on a date and you've got the person sitting across the table from you and they've got a big piece of spinach stuck in their teeth. What do you do? Do you speak up and say, hey, you've got a big piece of spinach stuck in your teeth or do you ignore it? Well, there's a difference, right? Being nice is when you don't say anything because you are embarrassed to embarrass them. So shame informs your choice. So you're going to let them be embarrassed because it's not your embarrassment. It's theirs. Or you can be kind and say, hey, why don't you go to the bathroom and take that spinach out of your tooth so you know that way you'll feel good about yourself. That's kindness. Kindness is saying hard things, but with compassion and love and kindness, right? This like, so that's the work environment as well. Hey, I noticed the last thing that you handed in that, that, that piece of work that you did, that feature you worked on, that didn't feel to me like your best work. I've seen better work from you and I'm, I'm here to talk about that. I want to talk about, is it the environment that we're creating that's that? Is it something else that's distracting you from work? Um, let's figure it out. Let's figure out how you can be better at the thing that you that we both know you are better at. And and let's kind of put that 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 thing, it's not about that thing, right? It's just a thing. It's just a small issue. It's about let's grow together. Let's find out a way to get healthier as people and through our relationship and get healthier with our work as well. So these are hard conversations because they require you to step out of your shame and embarrassment and into a place of compassion and love and kindness. And those three words that I've just mentioned don't come up in business context very often, right? They feel soft, they feel very feminine, they feel very weak in some ways. And yet those are the strongest things. Being compassionate, being empathetic, being kind allows a vulnerability which exposes people to this new channel of communication, which is, I want to show up at work. I want to be here. This feels psychologically safe. This feels like safety to me. And ultimately, if you think about what the way the human brain was evolved, is the job of the human brain is of the human brain is just to protect you. But right? that's all it does, really. And so, anytime it seeks out safety or finds safety, you're going to have this wonderful opening, this kind of a moment of like, 
um, I can let my guard down. And as soon as that happens, you have better communication, you have better opportunities for insights, and ultimately you have a better trusting relationship, which I think you and I both agree is kind of the the you know the, the ultimate thing that you want to have there is that that trust, that reliability. And there's other ways to measure this. Like, so I'll give you some practical examples. Um, when I was running the team at Envision, we would start the, the week with a meeting about work. So we spoke about what was going to happen during the week, almost kind of like a stand-up. Hey, who's working on what? How can we help you? How can we support you? But at the end of the week, on the Friday afternoon, we'd have a meeting and we we didn't talk about work. Every now and then work would slip in, but I'd say 90% of those conversations were not about work. They were about each other. How are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on at home? You know, How can we support you as friends as people. And I'm not advocating that you make your team at work, your family or friends, but the quality of that feels similar. It feels like caring. It feels like understanding. And why is that important? Because you end your week thinking not about work, but thinking about how you have gained support and love and support from the people around you and that we've closed the week out and that you can actually go and rest for that weekend. So you come back on Monday morning feeling that you're truly disconnected from the work and you've got an opportunity to reconnect with the other things in your life. And that cycle is very, very important. So that's just one practical example. Another way is to make your team smaller, that you can get to know each other. You can get to find out what it is that is meaningful for you and why you care about certain things, what your love language is and how you're going to communicate, what your style of communication is. And those things can happen when you've got a small team. If I'm managing 40 people, I can't do that. I mean, it's just impossible. It's ridiculous. If I'm managing 12 people, it's difficult to do. So the smaller the team, the more likely that's going to happen. So those are some practical examples of how it happens in the workplace and how you can create that trust. That's that's fantastic. I mean, a lot of really, you know, awesome, I think, things that you address there. I'm curious, like, in the work that, that you do as, you know, and and as advisor, you know, to a lot of these folks, I'd imagine like there's usually a pain point that comes up when they're about to hire you and they say, I've got this issue and I need your help. What, what is that point? Like what, 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 I mean, maybe there are several different types of points, but what are some of the things that come up with, you know, some of the folks you work with where they're like, I really need you to help me work through this. Um, well, what they say and what they actually have as a pain point might be slightly different to begin with, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's a scary part therapist, yeah. part advisor. Exactly. The, the first trip you go to the doctor when you're not feeling great and the doctor's like, what's going on? You're like, well, you know, I've got this cough. And then 15 minutes in the conversation, it's come something completely different, right? It's like the cough is just a symptom of something else. So I think, um, I think it always boils down to the relationships that they have with each other. If, if in my case, when I'm dealing with C-level executives and, and very high level executives, their primary problem is their executive team and their relationships with that executive team. So one of the reasons why they hire me is because they can't go to those executives and have conversations with their co-founders and have those conversations with them because it's about them. It's like the, the tension is about that person. They can't go to the board because they're worried that the board will think that they don't have control or they won't have an understanding of what's going on. And they're probably exhausted the other avenue, which is, you know, going home and talking to their spouses or partners, right? So at some point, <laughs> you bet you can only have so many conversations with your spouse or your partner about work. And then they're like, listen, just, yeah, can't deal with that. So, so very often I'll start with um, questions that are probably a little unusual. Things like, well, what's your body telling you? How is your body keeping score right now? And and very often, I can even see it. I can see if they're looking like they, they're not getting exercise, looking like they're suffering from uh, stress-related ills. Right? So I, can, I can literally see it, but I, I just, I, I'm not a therapist or a nutritionist, so I'm not going to say, you need to go and do this. I normally just ask them to tell me how their body is keeping score. And then the ripple effect around that. Well, what are your relationships like with your spouse and your partner? What are your relationships like with your family and your friends? What are your relationships like beyond that? Do you see your friends? Do you actually spend time with the people you like and love? That gives me an indication of, of where 
um, where they are and how they're showing up in the world. And then we can start to dig into the specifics of that because I don't think I need to tell you, like almost all stress comes from the inability to connect with others. So, so my thesis is that, uh, we're not separate. We're all just part of the same stuff and that we're having separate experiences within, you know, that larger, uh, universal experience, but I'm you and you on me and we're just having different experiences. And so when we're disconnected, that's feels bad. Like it feels any, like any other disconnection that you might have with your spouse or your partner, your children or your friends. And so I'm trying to explore that with those first few questions. And that's what I recommend to all my leaders is go to the people in your life, talk to them about what's ailing them, what's, you know, making them feel the way that they feel. And if you have a meaningful, deep, present conversation, you will slowly but surely peel back the bullshit and the the facades and the filters and find out that, you know, that there are things that are worth talking about. And so this plays out anecdotally, like I worked with a company that had a significant amount of, of co-founders, like I think eight or nine co-founders, it's like, you know, a lot of conflict. Um, and as the company had grown, those co-founders that had all kind of spread in different directions or, or moved towards different ideals. And so trying to resolve that is often like it's a, it's a big uh, project or a big part of the work that we do, but it has to start with that. Like, Hey, you're struggling as the CEO. Why? And then you find out they've got eight co-founders like, Oh, okay. Let's talk about that. Like what's the dynamic of having like eight siblings. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so those are the kind of anecdotal things and it's very often just relationships i'd, I'd say 90 percent of, of what i deal with is relationships um the other 10 percent might be around normal business stuff like is this the right business model for us are we really in the right market and those are honestly those are fairly easy pivots to make you can quickly get focus and and, and find out but um it's a little bit like jim collins says in good to great you've got to get the right people on the bus the right people in the right seats and then wrong people off the bus and that's really the work. The work is, well, like, who's dedicated to this? Who's are committed to this? Um, how are we going to work together? Are we in the right seats? Are we doing the right thing? And if not, that's fine. You know, um, let's help those people go somewhere where they they'll be much more welcome, welcomed. And um, I don't really believe in firing people. I normally will have like five or six interviews set up for them before I even talk to them, so that they can you know move on to a better position. Um, and in general, I think. The last time we did this, we were, most people had an average of a 40% increase in, in salary when they moved on to the next job. So, you know, this may not be the best position for them, and that might be your fault. Like, you might be holding them back. Uh, but that's a different conversation. We can talk about that another time. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. I mean, it, it does seem like a lot of the work you do is um, almost like playing therapist. You're like the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the show Billions. I think her, I think the character's name is Wendy Rose. Yeah, you're you're totally Wendy. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the the lead the design leader whisperer. Um, you know, I know a lot of the work that you do. It's is actually quite conversational. It's um, it's both um, advice driven, but also very much reactionary. Um, you know, to what you're hearing and listening to. You know, um, you know the people that are sharing their stories with you. Are there ever any times where you lean on tools or even exercises? You know, you have such deep background in design thinking um, to help navigate some of the organizational challenges that might be happening. Those could be personal from a leadership perspective, but they could also be um, more team based, like helping them solve a problem. Absolutely. So um, here's where. I lean quite heavily on the research. So I'm a big fan of Jim Collins, um, him and his team. I can't remember how big the team is, but they've got about 6,000 years worth of data now, or something like that, uh, collectively over all the organizations that they've studied. And so I think that's the longest and or uh, the, the most complete longitudinal study of businesses that exist. So I, I look very carefully at that work. I love um, their interpretation of what has you know, the Japanese concept of ikigai. Ikigai is, you know, what I like doing or what I love doing. What am I actually good at? How can I make money? And what does the world need right now? Uh, Jim Collins has got a slightly different version of that, which is what am I passionate about? 
what can I create economic value with and um, and can I be the best in the world at this thing or can I be of service to the world in this thing and where those three intersect um, that's that's the hedgehog right that's what he calls the hedgehog do you want to be a fox or a hedgehog um, and you know are you looking at every opportunity or are you just focused on the thing the one thing that you can do really well so ikigai the concept of the hedgehog those are very powerful frameworks people can do that in their personal life they can do that in work life um children can do it it's it's just it's a wonderful you know tool pr proactive tool i also when it comes to the specifics of the business i'm very interested in understanding how they can build momentum so what are the things that they can do every day that will ultimately lead to outcomes so this is a very simple framework um what can you do it might time. be a little hard to see but we can yeah, it, you can it, send me a screenshot I'll, later. Yeah, I'll explain it. Essentially, it's just a matrix of repetitive things that you can do. So the, think about the concept of endurance athletes. You know, if I want to run a marathon, I just got to do my five or six Ks every single day, right? That's going to build my base. And then maybe towards the end, I might do a little bit of extra intensity. Um, the same is true of just about every other t task that you want an outcome for. Do I want to build a social media presence? Well, I've got to post... X number of social media things because I'm going to train the algorithm. I'm going to train myself. I'm going to train my team to create content that will ultimately be relevant for my audience and the algorithm be you know be able to support that. Um, and that's uh, what Jim Collins calls the flywheel. What's the what's the the march that you have to do every day that'll ultimately get you to your goal? Uh, that's very proactive. You know what what is the small, tiny little activity that I can do every single day that'll ultimately lead to a much bigger outcome. Um, and I like to do these things because they're so simple and anybody can do them and they're not complicated. I'm not teaching somebody like a safe, agile framework that's going to take them six months to even grasp like the most basic version of that. Um, and I know there's probably people listening to this that are agile fans and good for you, but you know, that train has left the station a long time ago and you know, sorry about that, but it's much better to focus on smaller things that are clearly understood. Strategy ultimately is just a set of behaviors that we've all agreed to. It's not a plan. It's behavior because the plan is bullshit. The plan goes out the window as soon as you get a crypto winter or a dot-com crash or a recession or COVID. It's much better to have an anti-fragile set of behaviors that are going to work regardless of the circumstances. And that becomes your strategy. That's repetitive hey, I'm just going to do this every day and it's going to lead to things. And it's also easier. You don't have to be smart to do that. You just have to be consistent. You don't have to be the one with all the degrees and all the education and all the support. You just have to be the person who's willing to do that that rigorous, disciplined work every day. So those are the proactive things that I often include in my work. And and then just connect, making network connections to people that will help them. So, hey, it looks like you could do with some help from this kind of person or an advisor in this category or this domain, or here's the name of a therapist, you know, somebody who you can talk to specifically about issues that are not work related, but are related to your life uh, or a nutritionist or an exercise person, because we're a complete person, right? And all of those things matter. If you, if you're not feeling good about your body and your health and all that kind of stuff, physically and emotionally, you're not going to be able to show up at work. So um, in that case, I'm almost like a, re a reference source of like, here are all the wonderful human beings you can have in your circle and your kitchen cabinet, and you should build that and, and create mentorship and support and advice around yourself. I don't really see myself as the source of that. Just like I said in the beginning of the conversation, I'm more like a Malcolm Gladwell. I'm going out and collecting stories and looking for patterns and then crafting narrative around that so that that can be useful to more than just one person. And then publishing that, I, I write articles almost daily. Um, I do podcasts almost weekly. Um, I, I stay sharp by asking lots of questions and learning these things, but I'm not the source. I'm not, I, I don't like it when people reach out to me and say like, can you, can you fix my problem? Can you solve my problem? I'm not really a consultant in that sense. So um, getting a little topic here, but the idea behind this is of course that there are tools and frameworks that are appropriate for context understanding the context first, understanding the person, and then applying those tools is the better way around it instead of saying, well, I carry the agile flag or I carry the so-and-so flag and this is, this is I'm going to die on this. Kind of pointless because the context might be not, you know, 
might not warrant that. <laughs> that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you're kind of playing quarterback, or maybe not even quarterback is the right uh, you know metaphor here, but you are the source of you know um, amazing references that you can help guide these leaders as they navigate very complex problems. And by listening to them about those problems, you're able to direct them to the right, um, you know, right location to find, you know, whatever that tool framework, um, you know, book, um, whatever it might be process, um, to help them grow. Uh, so that, um, I think that's Sometimes a really it feels great like I'm place. more like a Ted Ted Lasso where I'm just like standing on the sidelines coming up with cheesy <laughs> cheesy lines. <laughs> hey, it's a it's it's a hit show and a successful uh football well, coach for a reason. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, um this has been a fantastic conversation, Richard. I, I really appreciate your perspective, you know, on building healthy teams and healthy individuals. And um yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for um, if anybody has, you know, any questions for Richard, um, I know that um, he's very active on social media, especially LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other places, uh, Richard, that, you know, people can find you and um, engage with you? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, I have a strong LinkedIn presence. I do not participate in the, in the Twitter circus anymore. Um, I'm on Instagram where I share a lot of my work, my art and my travels. Uh, you can go to richardbanfield.com if you want to learn about the work specifically and read some of the latest stuff that I've been publishing and my books, um, and richardbanfieldart.com if you want to see my paintings and the other work that I'm, I'm doing, um, uh, creatively. So those are the, the best places to find me and you can, um, you can sign up. I'll, I'll start publishing a newsletter soon. Well, something like that, but, um, well, maybe, maybe Adam, you'll just publish it for me because you've got a much better reach. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll be sharing all of those links in the show notes. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with Richard, um, or follow along with his amazing, uh, work in various different avenues. Um, but yeah, just wanted to thank you again for, for joining us today, Richard. Uh, we appreciate it. Much appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. Thanks.